For many years, I was doing corporate work in the U.S. and here in the pharmaceutical industry. But I got so disillusioned with work that there was one point that when we retrieve our message service, a voice message service, my password is the word F-U. And I had to do this 10 times a day. I was so happy because I was so up upset with work that I said, I'm going to do this and I'll find my way to quit. And photography was, became my way of escaping corporate life. When people ask me, why did you quit? And my usual answer is that, so I can make less money. But the truth is, the reason why I did that is because I felt with the skills that I was developing at that time, I'll be able to contribute to the uh, creating stories about people and make a, make a difference to their lives. So that's what I've been doing. So from a corporate world uh, wearing business suit, I end up like this. The picture on the left is with the Russian helicopter in Nicaragua and the one with the uh, uh, grenade launcher with the ML at Camp, at Camp Abu Bakr. Okay, I don't have any formal training in photography, so I have to relearn the new tricks. I have to read books. I stopped reading marketing books. I stopped reading Wall Street Journal but concentrated on really learning the craft of photography. And Eugene Smith and Gordon Parks became my heroes. They are not just only good photographers, but what they've created for Life Magazine and other work is to create photo essays that made difference to other people. What they did is because of these stories, people reacted to them and raised money to help their subjects. I had many exhibitions, and the working title is called With Passion and Purpose. I purposely um, selected that title is because most of my work is really related to that. Because I came from a marketing background, I always work with a goal in mind. I never go out and take pictures for nothing. There has to be an end product out of my work. So for the last so many years, I went to Nicaragua to document how the money from the U.S. government is supporting the Contras and making life for the Nicaraguans very difficult. I went to El Salvador to create a calendar project for the Human Rights Commission of the FMLN so that they can raise $25,000 to support their work. I went to South Africa to photograph Nelson Mandela, to show the world, and especially in San Francisco, that apartheid still exists that lifting the sanction of apartheid was wrong. And I went to Cuba primarily to show the impact of the U.S. embargo. Temple University Press was ready, willing to publish my book. But at the last minute, I said, I don't think it's a book because I don't have enough images to show the impact of the embargo to the Cuban people. I spent 18 years of my life documenting Filipino World War II veterans as they wait for equity in the United States. And the only reason I was doing this is to make sure that Filipinos and Filipino Americans will remember what America did to our heroes, that they, did, they received something uh, completely wrong. They deserve more from the U.S. government for the service that they did for the U.S. and our country. I went the last day, 2006, I played the African drum, the djembe. So I went to Africa to learn to play the djembe, but I ended up taking more pictures, and my work was exhibited in Milan, Italy, to raise money so a village in Africa can have safe drinking water. So that's the kind of photography I've been doing. It's more of advocacy work, more on photography that means a lot to me and to my subjects. So two days after 9-11, I was so upset when I had been hearing news that Muslims are being targeted with profiling and discrimination just because they practice Islam. So for the last 10 years I've been doing this, more than 10 years, 11 years now. So I've documented Muslim Americans in the United States to make sure people will know that they're like anybody of us, good citizens working hard to make a living for their community and for their families. Okay. These have been my guidelines uh, over the years. I think this uh, information is still relevant for uh, the future and for the uh, of visual storytelling. 
I all I firmly believe that photographers or documentary photographers must be measured by but should be measured by the impact of their work and not by the awards they receive. And that's very, very, very important. The basic foundation of visual storytelling remains the same. It's always about the subjects and not about us. Not about the cameraman and not about the photographer, but it has to be the people where we photograph, the story we are telling about. Our responsibility is not to showcase our talent, but to, or the cameras that we use. Because some people say, oh, I shoot a Leica. I'm a good photographer. That's not true. What's more important is that we do our story to create an awareness, to educate others on the plight of our subjects. The best way to capture our lives of sub subjects is to make sure that we understand their pain, their anger, and their happiness. Because it's only at that time when we feel their, the situation, we will be able to capture reality and be able to tell the truth about them. One crucial element of storytelling is to be a good editor. We really have to edit that work to a certain extent that we're telling the true story of our subject. One thing that I've been doing over the years in all this kind of work is I always include a marketing plan, a selling plan, a promotional plan in all my work because I firmly believe that all our work is will be useless if we don't reach our target audience. I never work to keep my work in, the, uh, in my closet or a hard drive. It has to be out there in many, many forms because that's my responsibility to my subjects. Okay. What happens now is that newspapers are no longer many stories. Magazines are not ho no longer hiring photographers to do long-term projects. So photographers like me have to be very quick. We have to react very quick on stories happening. Dark memories of torture, incarceration, disappearance, and death under Marcos. You know how I started this? I was riding on a cab in, uh, here in Manila, and I heard that tomorrow the 10, 10 8 to one claimants will be getting their $1,000 check. I dropped everything that the following day and go there to photograph. The, a group of individuals who are really uh, um, claiming for their money, which means it's a validated claim that they were tortured during Marcos time. So with this body of work, it's now being exhibited. There's a plan for a book project after this. And if I did not seize the moment, I'm not going to have this body of work. This is Tem Rivera, uh, Jess Santiago, and may he rest in peace, Sister Bersosa. One of the issues that I'm really concerned about is reproductive health bill. So in December of last year, uh, I spent the three Christmas in the last three years in the Philippines. I spent time at the Pabella Memorial Hospital to make sure I can photograph those many ba mothers delivering babies. Because I felt that with this body of work, I'll be able to con uh, participate in the debate related to the reproductive health bill. Also in March of 2011, a friend of mine said, called me and said, you know, Justice Abad of the Supreme Court is looking for a photographer to document situation in detention centers in the court system. And the problem is they don't have money. So are you willing? I said definitely because I felt that it's a major story that has to be documented to make sure that those people incarcerated in our detention centers will have a chance to get out early uh, uh, and get a fair trial. And I have exhibited them already, and there's a book on the pipeline for this book. In the United States, there's a great you know, problem of raising funds for our work. So people have to be creative in making organizations, creating collectives, to find a way where foundations, people with money, will be able to channel the resources to individual photographers. Ed Cassie, who's an old friend of mine from San Francisco, with his wife, Julie, created Talking Eyes Media. It's a uh, 5013C organization that can receive funds from foundations. In the Philippines, I think there's a need for us to do this because uh, photographers like me here in the Philippines need resources to be able to continue their work. 
So this is something, this is an idea that has to be explored. Facing Change, Documenting America. These are hotshot photographers that put together a collective so they can commi get commissioned work for a whole group, not just individuals. So that's one way also of doing, uh, putting your expenses in one bunch and sharing it rather than working individually. So they've been very, very successful with their work. Uh, there are many uh, forums now and photo groups. This is one with uh, Richard Coche Hernandez on the mobile uh, photo group. It's using the iPhone. Kickstarter uh, is crowdsourcing. I think this is something that we in the Philippines should be able to explore because when you have a crowds, uh, uh, crowdsourcing fund, you'll be able to collect donations from many, many people with a time frame. This immigrant nation by Theo, uh, Theo Rigby, he's an old friend of mine, got it, got the 15,000 he was asking just because of a good pr uh, presentation of what he needs. Uh, there's a proliferation of uh, black spots or blocks these days. And for me as an individual photographer, before you create one website for all your work, and for me it's wrong because you're not targeting the individual or the organization that you're trying to reach out. With the availability of WordPress.com or Blogspot, I was able to tailor a specific websites or, or, or blog for a particular target audience. So this one is documentary photography that just limits on a series of work that I've been doing related to documentary photography. I have one for street photography. I have one for other issues, even including the iPhone. Okay, one area where photographers can get some work in the future and now is to get commissioned by organization for a big project, specifically designed just for the web. This one is for the uh, ACLU of Northern California, tracking down pre people who've been uh, victims of surveillance by the U.S. government. I traveled all over the United States to document all these people and their experiences. Um, recently, when I went back in uh, July in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco Examiner ran an iPad app of my work from the Philippines. So these are all the options that we have now as photographers. Before we go for, you know, multiple spreads in magazines, you know, several pages in the newspaper, those are gone. Those are no longer existing today because the pages have shrunk so much that even their local photogra own photographers only have one picture a day on their pages. So, what's next for us? Um, I had the opportunity of using an iPhone. Um, about, I had an iPhone as a gift, as a Christmas gift. So I started testing it. And in fact, when I, before that, I said to, in one of the local forums that I think iPhone will be a good tool for street photography. And I was heavily criticized because they said iPhone will not do it when you go to Capo, they will grab your, your telephone and, you, you know, you, it's gone. But I said, I don't have an iPhone at that time. But since I started using the iPhone, I was able to really use the iPhone as a great tool for uh, my kind of work because it's small, it's quick, and it's not very visible to other people. It's like you're, I'm, just like a, I'm very big. And with a small camera, I can easily move and be hiding myself somewhere. But in the last four months, Sports Illustrated started running pictures taken by iPhone by Brad Mangin. New York Times, David, uh, Damon Winter won an award for the uh, newspaper of the year for his work in Afghanistan using an iPhone. And then recently, this is about three or four weeks ago, Ed Cashy, uh, did a series when he was doing a workshop in Aspen, Colorado for the New Yorker. So iPhone really is becoming the next generation, really the, the future Leica of, you know, of photographers. So what I've been doing with the, like, with the iPhone recently is doing some work. These are pictures I took in the Philippines 
and when I went back to um, uh, the United States. And most of this, the top part, the three pictures there, were all taken was out riding a taxi cab. I used the cab here going around, so I took pictures. Also, the bottom part are all in the Philippines. When I went back to the U.S. in July of this year, I, I was at home and reading a book, and I realized almost 50 years ago, there's a guy, and his name is uh, um, Eugene Smith. He did a whole series on Pittsburgh using a Leica. So I said, I can create that for San Francisco. So I started thinking, creating a San Francisco project using the iPhone. But to share you what I do as a photographer when I have in this kind of a project, I started thinking, where can I exhibit this? What kind of funding can I get? I, had, I talked to the, uh, uh, the director of photography of Chronicle and said, if I have these materials, will you run it? I even wrote a letter to the senior creator of the Museum of Modern Art and I said, I'm doing this and I'd like you to consider this for future exhibition. So these are some of the pictures I took with an iPhone. Okay. Photographers these days have to have an anchor project. What I mean with an anchor project is the one that will finance your life for at least six months or a year. Either an assignment, a commercial assignment, whatever assignment it is, or a grant money that will sustain you so you could do other work. In, here in the Philippines, this is part of the jewels of Rio Tuba. I had an assignment, you know, I was not expecting it after reading my book on the veterans. said, can you do this? And I was sent there without any guidelines and I started taking pictures. Then I realized that, you know, this body of work is something uh, that shows to be the value of responsible mining, especially the other work that I do about poverty and homelessness and lack of education in our country. So these are the images. There are about 4,000 workers living and uh, working at Rio Tuba. They get four months bonus a year. This is December. These people are, on the average, have 35 years of service. And at Rio Tuba, if your grandfather works for the company, the son and the daughter and the grandkids have first chance of getting employed if they are qualified. They provide a, uh, a La Salle type of schooling, or high school is 300 pesos a year, and for the grade school is 150. They get free housing. These kids are all scholars, and you know how to qualify for scholarship? All they need is to get a passing grade. They get four-year college scholarship, complete with uh, uh, expenses to go home twice a year from wherever you're studying back to Palawan. This is the kind of housing that they're getting. And in terms of rehabilitation, they're testing out how, to, how they can plant rice to mount, mine out areas. This is part of the Gawad Kalinga housing for uh, indigenous people. And the hospital, they provide 100% free hospitalization, not only for the IPs or the employees, even the residents of the neighboring towns, because there's no hospital in that area. One of the works that I've been doing uh, is called This Is My Home. This is a series of pictures I took on the street of San Francisco, uh, uh, Manila. This is Rojas Boulevard. Have you seen somebody on the, living on the street with a, uh, uh, a wall clock? This girl is like riding an SUV all over the city, all over Manila, on top of a heap of garbage that the parents collect. This is a family in Malate. All, they, all the kids are going to school, but their only problem is every night they don't know where they'll be sleeping. This is on Espana Boulevard. Uh, these are kids in Bonondo scooping uh, a, a water leak on the floor, on the street, so they can take a quick shower. This is on Espana Boulevard at, in the morning. I took this picture in early 2009. And when I took the photograph, I don't know the person, uh, part of the pictures, but my style of work in relation to this kind of work is I keep going back, keep visiting 
my subjects. And I went back to Paterno Street, and I found out that that girl in black is Rodali S. Musende. And this is what I found out about Rodali. Rodali was born and raised on Paterno Street since birth. She's in high school, and when she studies, she uses a candle or the street light. Sometimes they sleep wet when it's raining, and they have to be cautious all the time because crime happens around them and even death. So uh, sometimes she doesn't have money for uh, jeep fare to go to school, doesn't have food. And last summer, when he had a job, she earned 800 pesos, but the police on Paterno Street took this, the bending stall of her mother, so she has to use that $800 to pay, to, to uh, recover the, their stuff. So that's the life of uh, Rodali Musende. So what I did, and in the whole process of working on Paterno Street, there are people who have died already. The one at the bottom is Aling Choleng. She moved to Paterno Street when she was 19. And she died about four, a month ago when she's 79. It meant that she's been living on the street for 60 years, raising a family there uh, all, uh, all her life. That I, I don't know what happened to her. She's a person being fed by workers on Paterno Street. I've been trying to locate her. I can't find her anymore. And on Paterno, they, every morning, the local residents are the ones cleaning it. So, these are the life on Paterno Street. The inquiry ran a story in um, March of 2012, when, when uh, Rodley graduated. You know how many hits, shares that they got? Almost 7,000 shares on Facebook alone. Uh, GMA News, how is Severino run a story about Rodali S. Musende? There is about 13,000 shares. So if you multiply that with 1,000 friends, that's a lot of people who have seen the story of Rodali Musende. The reason why I'm sharing this is because the new media uh, the social media that we're doing, is, is, we can do it. So what I'm saying is uh, every opportunity that we could use any distribution channel to tell a story, please use it because it helps a lot. So Rodali, through Facebook, uh, Rodali was able to receive extra money, about 4000 a month for the next 10 months. Uh, before this, using an iPad, I was able to get her a four-year college scholarship. And on top of that, she's getting another 5,000 pesos for her, month, uh, her monthly expenses. Oh, by the way, I also created a website specifically for Rodali S. Musende. I'd like to share with you a short three-minute clip of a, uh, the pictures I took of Rodali and Paterno Street. Pus pal 
Nakikita ko ang bata sa tuwing umaga sa pagsisimba ko sa simbahang kiyapo Minsan, isang gabi ako'y napadaan ang patang now coming from school we have Rodali with us here and I'd like to request her to go upstairs on the stage so yeah I think she really has inspired a lot of people on the street in fact she's the only co uh, person in the street on Paterno going to college a lot of people there are not in school so and I'm sure Rodali will Finish college. Thank you very much.